done uh, to open the first grade A goat dairy and cookery in the state of Wyoming. Um, I've kind of tailored it a little bit towards the progression of running a business and not so much raising goats or making cheese or milking. But if there's any specific things that you guys want to know or any questions that you have, we can deviate. The slides don't really matter. Um, but uh, that is how I had it originally planned. Um, does everybody here have goats? No? Do people, are people interested in making cheese, running dairy? Um, yeah? <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, well, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work, as you all know. Um, so, like I said, my goal is to kind of talk you through what we've done from a business perspective and things that you should think about if you wanted to take it to the next step. Um, is anybody here interested in actually becoming a commercial dairy? Okay, so I'm probably going to go through that section a lot faster. <laughs> Um, well, we're happy to answer all your questions, yeah. too, like, towards yeah, the end. Yeah. Uh, that might lead more room for questions. So. so just to give you a little background on what we are and who we are, um, Ben and I originally started Slow Goat Farm together in Lander, Wyoming. Ben is born and raised in Lander, uh, kind of been a jack of all trades over the years, uh, bike mechanic, electrician, ranch hand, you name it, barista. <laughs> I moved to Lander in 2012 to work for the University of Wyoming in the Nature Conservancy as a, a wetland ecologist and a botanist for them and managed the wetland program in the state for the last 10 years or so. Um, but we really fell in love over food. Food is our love language. We like to grow our own food. We wanted to wild harvest, and it just kind of was natural that we would try making cheese at some point. I'm from Wisconsin. It's in my blood. <laughs> can't <get> it. <laughs> I had cheese curds for lunch. <laughs> go pack, go. Yeah, I can't, I can't help it for sure. So it was kind of only natural that we would try making cheese at some point. Um, in 2013, uh, we ran into uh, Stephen D.M. Doyle at one of the garden expos in Lander, and they were selling milk under uh, a herd share program, so it was still illegal to buy milk in the state of Wyoming, but we could you know, pay them to own a portion of a cow, and then they would give us milk once a week. And so we started making mozzarella and ricotta and butter and just playing around, trying to learn what we could do. Uh, about a couple years after that is when the Wyoming Food Freedom Act has passed. Does everybody know what the Wyoming Food Freedom Act is? Um, so we're super thankful for that. Uh, you know, it not only allowed us to produce product in our own license on the Inspected Home Kitchen, but it also gave us access to more raw milk. So we started expanding our cheese repertoire, uh, you know, experimenting with goat milk, uh, trying different things with cow milk, and really just kind of honing in on our cheese skills. We are completely self-taught. Um, we have gone to a few classes over the years, but you can learn a lot of books, a lot through books, and the willingness to experiment and fail. The fun thing about cheese is if you fail, as long as your food's safe, you still have something that resembles cheese. It's just not exactly what you wanted. So, but our chickens did eat a lot at the beginning. <laughs> uh, so we ended up moving to the country, oh gosh, in 2014, and I'm very thankful for that opportunity. Um, a lot of young producers, if we you know, if your parents didn't homestead or if you don't come from generational wealth, it's pretty darn impossible to actually live your homesteading dreams, right? And so we moved out to the country and had 15 acres that we were able to, to homestead in for a while. And we were able to get a couple of Nigerian boars. These are our first three goats. Um, you can't see Aggie's head, but she actually just died uh, two weeks ago. So she's been with us for nine years, almost nine years. She was just really old. Yeah, she died of old age. Yeah. We checked. <laughs> we want to make sure biosecurity is very important to us. Um, but so we, you know, we got our own goats, and through that time we'd been making cheese with other people's milk. We finally had the opportunity to have our own milk, and that's how we uh, developed Slow Goat Farm. You know, we don't have speed goats; they're slow goats. It's a slow <laughs> cheese. All of that inspiration is from him, <laughs> in the name and the design, um, and. Uh, we took our, our product to the Garden Expo for the first time, I think, in 2016, and we had such good reception on the quality of our product that we quickly bought more goats and bought more goats and kept expanding and really started taking off as a business. Um, we owe a lot of our success to the farmers markets. Uh, it's one of the most amazing things about the Wyoming Food Freedom Act and the local food movement in Wyoming is that uh, we have access to um, a culture that wants our product and we have an outlet to sell it. 
Uh, farmers markets are a great opportunity for all different kinds of people, whether you know, you're know you just wanting to produce stuff for your family and sell the extra off for, uh, for feed costs, or if you're wanting to actually do business development. So one of the things that we've loved about our farmers market is we could test out products. We could work on quality, we could work on product development, packaging, and really see what fit, what worked, what didn't work. It was also a really, really good way to sh connect with customers. Um, you know, you kind of have a ready-made customer base at a farmer's market. Uh, that, that first 10% of your customer base is the people that want to buy your product, right? And so those are the people at the farmer's market. You can get a little beyond that um, because you have the opportunity to educate the public. You have the opportunity to uh, teach people that, you know, goat cheese doesn't have to taste like licking the backside of a billy goat. It can actually be pretty darn good. And one of the ways that we've done that is through giving out free samples. We were doing a lot, sorry. Um, I highly recommend giving away free samples if you're actually trying to grow your business. People aren't gonna know why your product is better than the rest unless they can taste it. And that not only helps sell you and your product, it helps educate people that there's all this different opportunity out there for quality and types of products. Uh, and it's also a great way to connect you with your customers and share your story. The reality is people aren't just buying your product, they're buying you and they're buying the story that you tell, the way you present yourself. And so it's important to think about that when you're at the farmer's market. Uh, the way that you have your booth display, branding, uh, investing in a branded tent so people know where to find you. Um, stickers are always a great thing because people love stickers and it helps make your brand known even more from far. Um, and, you know, people like to write. If you have stickers or t-shirts or something, it's always good. So if you're really thinking about business development and growing your business, um, like I said, trying different products and making quality products, but also building your customer base, one of the ways that we had a lot of success doing that is through building an email list. Uh, we would often run out of our product, and so it was a great way to encourage people to sign up. It gives our customers exclusive access to our product, which makes everybody feel kind of special. It also allows you to tailor your production each week and understand what your customers are actually wanting. Um, it also allowed us to be a little bit more flexible. So, you know, we're at the farmer's market for a specific amount of time, but not everybody can get there. So it allowed customers to come later to get our product, or they could buy stuff, uh, order it, and then pick it up at a drop-off location. The easier you can make it for people to buy your product, especially a food freedom product, the better off you are. And it's fantastic the strides that's made uh, recently with being able to sell at the, the local Fremont local market and different types of bottles like that because that really gives people a lot bigger opportunity to sell. Um, there is a limit, there is a ceiling to farmers markets in reaching those customers, right? You can't sell to grocery stores, you can't sell to restaurants under the Food Freedom Act. So one of your next options is expanding into new markets. That takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of energy, but it is a really great way to find new customers around the state. Um, we started selling in Casper a little bit, mostly in Jackson. Rock Springs is an amazing community that wants a lot of good food and they don't have access to it. Um, the things to think about. Uh, the other thing you want to think about is marketing and branding. Uh, we, you know, the first slide I had was, you know, our very first logo <laughs> as it transitioned into uh, Medicine Bow Creamery, who we are now. Um, but Slow Goat Farm is what we really are at heart. And, the transition from our first logo to this one, I think, has made a big difference in people recognizing our brand and recognizing who we are. And I know people don't like it, but social media is really important. <laughs> it's a pain in the butt to manage, but the reality is Wyoming lives on Facebook. Uh, maybe less so now, I think, it's transitioning to Instagram, but being able to connect with your customers through social media is actually incredibly important. It takes a lot of time, and it's something we're paying for if it's something you're not comfortable in, but you want to do business development. So some things to think about selling your products. Um, it's, you know, we have all kinds of awesome producers in the community and hosting tours and tastings is an awesome way to connect to a different type of customer base and to get your product out there for more people to try. It's also a lot of fun, you know, teaching charcuterie board development classes or wine and cheese tasting or uh, cheese and flowers. You know, there's all kinds of different things to do, but tours and tasting is a great way to kind of think outside the box. Um, you want to think about product size and pricing. So we would sell uh, our Chev at the farmer's market for $28 a pound. We had a lot better reception selling it uh, in three and a half ounce packages for $6 versus uh, eight ounce package for 14. Mm -hmm. 
So thinking about, you know, what's a reasonable price point for your customers to buy and how that impacts your packaging. Another thing to um, recognize is that product name actually impacts customer perception, especially in cheese. So if you have like a Havarti or a Gouda or a mozzarella, people have a preconceived notion of what it should taste like and how much it should cost. But if you have a different name for it, it gives you a little bit more flexibility to say, you know, this is a mozzarella style, well, this is a Havarti style. <laughs> and there's a whole range of what should be a Havarti, but we're all used to one particular type. So just using creative names that have some type of connection to your local surroundings can actually expand and make your product more flexible. Uh, the other thing that I highly recommend is try to make it easy. Like I said, our email list was a really successful way to do that. Uh, we considered getting like a cheese vending machine and plugging it in so you could just like go pick it up and buy something, um, some way to keep it cold. But you know, a lot of our customers would like to buy our product, but they don't want to go to the farmer's market, and they can't go to the grocery store, but they don't think about it till they want feta for a salad that night. So there is a lot of creative ways in the, in the food freedom realm that you can sell your product and still meet all of the, the requirements and bounds that were, are on us, right? So running a home creamery is awesome. I'm so thankful for the opportunity to do that, but it does have some challenges that we all have to deal with. Uh, the reality is there's efficiency and scale. It takes about the same amount of time to make five pounds of cheese as it does 50. And you're really limited by the type of equipment you have, um, the size of equipment you can lift, uh, and that dictates the amount of cheese you have and the price per pound that you're making, right? The goal is that we could all pay ourselves a little bit in some of these endeavors. Uh, and so the more efficient you can be, the, the more you can uh, make. Uh, thankfully, he can lift like 10 gallon pots, but I can only lift, lift five. <laughs> um, one of the other things that is a pretty hard thing to negotiate on a smaller scale is employees. Uh, you know, we're all, we're generally already pretty maxed out in the amount of time that it takes to run a dairy and run a creamery. And so it's nice to hire an employee to help you, but they're not necessarily they're taking a burden off you, which is incredibly valuable, but it doesn't always increase your profitability to pay for them. So it's a balance with having employees. But you know, there's intern opportunities, there's ways to teach, there's ways to um, work it out, but it can be a challenging endeavor. Uh, distribution is what we kind of hit a wall on, trying to figure out how to get our product to other places. Um, and it ties into everything, right? So we need employees to go to different places to sell cheese, but we can't afford the employees to sell more cheese. Uh, so I know there's some new opportunities for distribution in the area, and which is absolutely fantastic. Um, I don't know enough about it at this point, but that might help people in the room get their product to more places. And food safety is always a huge concern. It's sometimes a, a uncomfortable thing to talk about because all of us want to do the best job we can for food safety. Um, but it is something that we can always strive to do better, right? Uh, working in a home kitchen, cross-contamination potential with allergens is huge. You know, if you're baking bread or eating shellfish, uh, trying to manage your space and keeping everything apart and clean is really important. And we got to the scale in our home kitchen where it actually became pretty hard to cook lunch because we're in the middle of cheese makes. But you just have to manage, use a lot of bleach, and do your best, uh, and be conscious of it. Um, Another thing I highly recommend for anybody that's producing milk and selling it to the public is milk testing. Uh, it not only allows you to know that you're doing a really good job with your food handling practices, but it's a way to share your customer or tell your customers and show your customers that you're taking that extra step. It also teaches you a lot. When, do you have a question? Okay. <laughs> when we started testing our milk, uh, we learned a whole lot of things. We actually recently switched from hand milking to using a machine, and we thought it would be so much more sanitary using a machine because you don't have like hair and poop falling in your bucket of milk, right? Uh, but there's a lot more connections that you need to manage and keep clean. And we found that following the manufacturer's cleaning processes wasn't enough. And so we had to completely disassemble our milking machine every time, and that really increased the quality of our milk. We also found that switching to how we cooled our milk made a huge difference in quality. Um, when we first started milking, you know, we filter our milk and we put it into the freezer to, we put it in half gallon jars and stick it in the freezer, because right, freezer should make things cold fast. But 
you should legally cool your milk down to below 40 degrees within two hours. That's the standard that is like the grade A dairy recommendation or legal requirement. Um, if you can cool it down faster, you're gonna have a lot higher quality product. Uh, bacteria are always growing, good bacteria too. You know, they're breaking down that lactose, that sugar, making lactic acid, but they're also breaking down fats and proteins. And so the, the faster you can cool down your milk, the more you slow down those bacteria, even the good ones, and it can take up to six hours to cool down the middle of a half gallon jug in a, in a um, freezer. So we switched to a water bath system, something I highly recommend on a home scale just to have high quality milk. It's really not too bad. We just used a little tub of water in our refrigerator and then we had uh, water bottles in our freezer. Anytime we'd milk, we'd stick a jar in our water bath, we'd swap out our frozen water bottles and it cooled down our milk to below 40 degrees within like an hour, hour and a half. So. How do you test the um, temperature of the milk safely? Um, it's a sanitized thermometer. Uh, you can talk about milk testing. Mm -hmm. Where and how do you do that? So there's a few different labs you can use. Um, and if there's uh, local producers that want to pool their resources, that's even better because then you can save on shipping costs. Um, we, when we first started, we used, oh gosh. Microbial research out of Fort Collins, and on like the second Tuesday of the month, they do raw milk testing uh, for ten dollars a sample. Off. I think it's ten bucks, or it was a couple years ago. Um, and they test for somatic cell count, um, bacterial count, coliforms, uh, things that impact milk quality. We have switched. We have since switched to uh, TDA Labs, which is out of Greeley, and they do a whole slew of things. So you can choose what test you want. We look at uh, somatic cell count, which is an indication of how healthy your animals are. Um, we will culture out our milk if we have a high somatic cell count, just to see if there's any potential bacteria. And we've actually noticed, we've been able to catch subclinical mastitis in a number of our animals by doing that. Um, we test for fat, protein, a few other things. Um, and I really like TDA labs, they've been great to work with. But so is microbial research, they're the ones that helped us figure out some different sanitation practices for our equipment. How often do you send milk out to be tested? When we were home producing, we were testing once a month. Um, we do since every we're, every uh, week. yeah, right now we're doing it every, every other week. But we're mostly concerned right now about building a baseline for our animals and understanding what our fat and protein is from a, a commercial dairy perspective. What was the name of that second lab in Greece? TDA Labs. And they've been great to work with. Uh, if you ask them, they will send you equipment. It's super easy. Um, if you just, uh, if you want like a, you can test individual animals. So you can t test individual teats if you're concerned about mastitis on one section or another. Um, or you can test a, a whole herd sample. And so we'll do both. It just kind of depends on what's going on with our animals at the time. Um, but you have a, a little jar or a little test tube that they'll send you uh, or that you can buy. And you have a sanitized ladle, mix up your sample. Uh, make sure that it's cooled down to 40 degrees, collect it, put it in the mail with some ice packs. The trickiest part is mailing. Um, we live in Saratoga, Wyoming. It's like geographically impossible to overnight anything, but if you're in Casper or Bremerton or Lander, it's a little bit easier. But. How, um, if you don't have a machine and people are still, like if you're hand milking, what's the sanitation process for that? Like, do you clean before you milk? Like, how do you? Is the animals the space or? Yes. Um, so in general, whether you're hand milking or machine milking, our practice is uh, we bring up the animals on the stand, uh, we wipe down their udders, uh, just like physically make sure that there's you know, not a ton of dirt or poop or something on them. Uh, we'll clean off their udder with a hot soapy rag and we do one, one teat per side. So each teat has its own, you know, has less cross-contamination. Uh, we'll then dry them off. We have a teat dip, so we actually use Chlorhexidine, a diluted chlorhexidine solution as our teat dip, um, but there's a number of different teat dips that you could use. We're looking at some different options in the future because chlorhexidine can be a little bit harsh. It can cause, you know, need a little drying. Um, so you sanitize, you dry everybody off, you squirt the little bit of milk out, and then you can hook them up to milk or hand milk. So hot soapy water, sanitizer solution, dry them off, strip the first little bit, bit of milk out. Right the first little bit of milk has a super high bacterial count because it's right next to the opening where that orifice is. Yep. So if they're laying down in the dirt, it can potentially give you a bad reading. 
Yeah. So if you're actually taking samples from your goats and you want to do teat specific, make sure you get out an ounce or so, half ounce. Three uh, or four good streams. It's worth having a strip cup as well. So it's just a little like a little cup that has a mesh screen on top. And if you strip into that, if there's any chunkies or little bits of blood or something, that'll help you notice if there's a potential sign of infection that you should be conscious of. Um, when you're done with your milk, no matter what, you should filter it as well. Uh, there is specific milk, milk filters. It's like three microns or something. Um, if you just Google milk filters, you can find it. Um, coffee filters work in a pinch. But having a, a specific milk filter helps reduce potential bacteria. And, and then when they're feeding the kids, I'm sorry. No, we're good. To your question. When they're feeding the kids, like how often do you milk when they still have to feed the kids? It gets tricky. Um, so what we chose to do when we were home producers is co-raise or dam raise, I guess. We didn't co-raise, we dam raised. So the moms would raise the babies for two weeks, and then we started separating the babies at night. If you have a few goats, it's fine. If you have like 25 goats, it's a pain in the butt to separate 40 to 50 kids out. So we actually bottle feed now. Um, but we would physically separate the babes from the moms uh, at night for around 12 hours. We'd milk the moms first thing in the morning and then let the kids back on to nurse all day. And then at two months, we'd wean. Yeah. Any other questions before we move forward? Happy to answer any questions. Like I said, this is pretty much tailored to like infrastructure and like understanding the creamery so i didn't know if we were asking questions as we go did you um just organically build your email list or did you buy any lists from we organically built our email list okay. yep um every time we were somewhere we'd set out an email list uh, since we would often sell out of product it really encouraged people to participate and that way it gave them exclusive access and they didn't have to stand in line yep All right, so this is the part where it may be too technical and we don't have to go into it. But if you get to where we are and you're like, man, I really want to keep making cheese. This is so fun. I'm really happy with what we're doing. But that next step is a big one. Um, the next couple slides are geared towards understanding the things you should think about, the chapters that you should write in a business plan, basically, and the questions you should be asking yourself. But this is very valuable as well if you're still a home producer and you're building your infrastructure. Because like we're learning upstairs uh, with our keynote speaker today, you know, every extra step is a dollar wasted. Every, you know, creating a functional environment is really important. Uh, I'm so thankful for the Wyoming Food Freedom Act for the opportunity to try making cheese and learning organically because to, make, to be a commercial dairy, it's an 800,000 to a million dollar investment in, in infrastructure and equipment, and that's not including the property. Uh, so if you want to take that step, it's totally valuable. There is a lot of demand in this state for locally made product, and we are basically only producing for our property. Um, so there is a big open market out there for, for cheese makers in Wyoming. Um, but you need to be thoughtful about it. You really need to understand uh, what your market is, where you're going to sell, how you're going to sell, who you're going to sell it to. Um, the Wyoming Small Business Development Center is an absolutely amazing resource that is there to help you every step of the way. They can do market analysis with you. They can help you write your business plans. Um, understanding if you want to be a grade A versus grade B dairy is an important question. Uh, if you want to be grade, if you just want to make cheese, you can be a grade B dairy. The equipment is the same. You have slightly more lenient uh, rules on your somatic cell count levels and uh, that's about it. <laughs> but if you want to sell fluid milk or uh, high moisture products like yogurt, ice cream, uh, cottage cheese, you have to be a grade A dairy. One of the challenging parts about green, being a grade A dairy and selling milk and yogurt and ice cream is you actually have to have specific packaging equipment to package all of those products for you uh, automatically. You can't like pasteurize your milk and then pour it into a container and then put the lid on it, which is annoying. But those are some of the rules that you have to be conscious of. Um, a question to ask yourself is, do you want to be seasonal versus year round? That really impacts your herd size, your infrastructure needs. You know, multiple kidding events means multiple spaces for wet versus dry does, you know, newborn kids versus not. And so those are always questions you want to be asking. Um, are you going to, uh, do you have pasture space? Um, are you going to be a pasteurized versus raw production? 
Um, if you're in, if you're making cheese under a grade A or grade B dairy, you have to pasteurize your product if it's going to be aged for less than 60 days. So that basically means if you're going to do raw milk cheeses, you can only do hard cheeses because any of your bloomy rinds are going to go past their prime before 60 days. Chev doesn't last 60 days. Um, so you, you're pretty much limited to hard cheeses. But if you want to do some of the fresher stuff, you have to pasteurize. And that's a slightly different equipment. Uh, and the inspectors do not like it if you have raw and pasteurized product in the same space. Mm -hmm. You can definitely do it, but you have to be thoughtful and you have to work with them um, on how you're going to move about your facility to make both pasteurized raw products. How many goats do you currently have for this type of production and what kind of property do you have? So the best, we've, we've tour, toured a lot of dairies and the number that we continually hear is if you want to be a commercial dairy and be profitable, the right herd size is between 70 and 200. Where you're... Uh, it's a sweet spot. Yeah, it's a sweet spot where like the number of employees you need match your profitability. Um, it really doesn't take that much extra energy to raise you know, 20 goats versus 50 or 50 versus 100. So we uh, live in a weird business model. Um, we work for one of the premier luxury ranches in the country and we're mostly producing food for uh, our restaurants and for our guests. Um, so we are a agritourism opportunity at the moment. Our but, business model doesn't work for anybody else. Yeah. You, have to, you have to have a big backer to be able to do it. You guys are on the brush for granted. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. you can produce product on there for them to use in their yep. restaurant. So to be able to utilize, this is one of the most annoying things, but to be able to utilize any dairy products that are produced in a commercial kitchen, it has to be produced in accordance with food laws. So that means food freedom cheese cannot be used in a commercial kitchen. So that is why we are a grade A dairy. So they had to build the creamery in the uh, dairy to be yeah. able to use it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. But, from a business perspective, it is definitely the herd size of around 70 to, to 200 seems to be the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. Over 200, it seems like the infrastructure is just too great uh, to manage where your profitability starts to go down. But all of that impacts the equipment you need, right? So like there is efficiency of scale. You want to be thinking about the minimum and maximum production. And that could even be at home. You know, you can buy a, a 15 gallon pasteurizer or a, you know, a way to cool your milk with a couple thousand dollar piece of equipment and it might actually make your life a whole lot easier than trying to manage five refrigerators. By the time that we were taking the steps to build a dairy, we had like five refrigerators and four freezers. <laughs> and we had to completely change out one of our spare bedrooms as a refrigeration space. <laughs> so that's where you hit that like, gosh, I just, do I need to take the next step? And if I'm gonna take the next step, what does it take? <laughs> So if you're gonna take the leap and you, oh, sorry. No, I was just gonna ask, what, you guys run many Nubians? We raise Nigerian dwarfs, Nubians, and Alpines. Okay. Our we're, favorites are the mini Nubians. Okay. We're still in her development. Yeah. We're okay, because a friend of mine got a mini Nubian from you guys mm -hmm. over in Saratoga. Mm -hmm. and, but yeah, I was just curious. So on the minis, or the, on your breeds, do you think the more moderate breeds, taking less feed is more efficient to be able to, Make more milk and make more money. It depends on what your goals are. Okay. So um, we start. I have full size Nubians, so I'm wondering because they're huge. <laughs> yeah, they, they can be really huge. Yeah. It really depends on what your goals are. So from a breed perspective, uh, Nigerian dwarfs are what we started with. We love them. They're super cute. They're actually bred to have the sweetest, richest milk out of all the dairy goats. Tastes like melted ice cream. It's like six to seven percent butter fat. Makes awesome cheese. But you only get like a quart to a half gallon a day. If you are, so it makes exceptional cheese, but you don't get as much yield. We like the Nubian crosses because we get a smaller goat that's easier to handle. They're cuter from an agritourism perspective, um, but we kind of get the best of both worlds with a little bit higher yield, but we're still maintaining that high butter fat. Uh, we have some Alpines in our herd right now, and Alpines and Sanins are really big dairy producers. Our Alpines are giving us I keep getting a phone call from somebody, and I don't know if it's an important one or if you need to take it. Yeah, Sorry. it's a tough one. Um, so our alpines are 
really awesome producers from a volume standpoint. We have one girl that'll give us three gallons a day, but she only has like one to two percent butter fat. So if you're in the, if you're focused on dairy and your goal is selling milk, the ideal breed is the one that's going to give you the most milk, right? We are more interested in cheese making, so we're more concerned about fat and protein. So I don't really care if I get a gallon of milk. If a gallon of milk from the Alpines uh, it only gives me, you know, a pound of cheese, but I can get two pounds of cheese out of my, my Nigerian crosses, I'd rather do those. Plus they're cute. <laughs> but it depends on what your goals are. Um, there's a little bit of difference in flavor too. Uh, the Alpine milk is a little bit more savory and chalky, and a lot of commercial cheese is using Alpine milk because they're buying dairy, they're buying from dairies that are using Alpines to produce the most milk they can, and so you get a little bit drier product. But you're not hand milking those mini breeds, are you? Um, I have. <laughs> have you really? It's like milking your babies. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say that's you have to. <laughs> yeah. Um, we do have a machine. Uh, so we, we have a six goat milking stanchion. We can milk up to six goats at a time. Uh, when we, it, the six goats seems to be kind of the sweet spot with like purple tunnel and mm. I don't know <laughs> the strength. <laughs> we generally hand milk anybody that we have like less than you know six to eight goats. Uh, we'll hand milk to start, but since we are a great dairy, it gets a little bit more tricky. The inspectors would prefer us to utilize our our you know fully sanctioned equipment. Um, when we're hand milking, it's usually just for feeding our kids. Yeah. Any other questions before we move on? Um, so if you are like us and you decide you want to take the leap of actually becoming a grade A dairy or creamery, uh, I highly recommend visiting as many other creameries and dairies as you possibly can. Um, a lot of people are generally really kind and open to sharing what they've learned. Uh, imitation is the highest form of flattery, right? Um, people can get a little funny about asking about recipes, but the reality is uh, you really can't create or uh, you can't completely copy somebody's cheese. It comes down to you know the terroir of where you're at, the, the taste of your goat's milk, even as simple as like how fast you stir can impact the texture and flavor of your product in the end. Um, but visiting as many dairies and creameries as you can will really give you an idea of different types of infrastructure, things that work well and things that don't. The Pasteurized Milk Ordinance, if you haven't heard about it, is your Bible. It is a 450 page document that you are regulated against. I highly recommend reading it over and over and over again. There is a section of it, a large section of it is related to shipping and receiving and transferring milk. And so if you're not buying in milk from another dairy, that doesn't fly. But it is what you will be regulated against and it is what you need to build to. So understanding it is important. Uh, and I highly recommend working with consultants on specific aspects of the bill. The reality is they're gonna save you money, especially on um, some of the food safety and um, design aspects. The inspectors made it very clear that they are here to uh, regulate us, not to help us build. Once you are built, they are very happy to help work with you and help make sure that you're doing everything right and they've been great to work with, but they're not here to build your business plan for you. So, pasteurized milk ordinance is your Bible. So, some things to think about with infrastructure, and this can be from a large scale or a home scale. If you're building out the spaces you wanna be in, just some stuff to consider. Uh, your barn layout is really important if you're going to have wet versus dry doughs and how you're going to manage them. The way we, we have two different barns right now. We have one for our milking doughs and then one for our dry doughs because it's a pain in the butt to try to deal with all the dry doughs that want to come in and get grain and be milked. <laughs> <laughs> it just prolongs your day. So understanding separation of space and how you're going to manage that is important. Um, making sure you have enough hay and gray storage for what you need and that's related to if you're going to have pasture, if you're going to dry lot feed them. Um, or both, uh, especially here in Wyoming in the winter time, you know, the reality is you're gonna have to feed out hay for a subset of the year, so making sure you have enough space to keep that hay good. Um, you know, you don't want snow blowing in and having half of your hay rot out because it was sitting on the ground and froze and then got moldy. Everybody says, you know, goats can eat everything, but the reality is they're really picky and they are susceptible to a lot of uh, ailments if you feed them poor quality food. So. On your hay and grain, and then like versus pasture, what do you guys feed? And then also like how do you think the pasture? Because I've heard that if you have a mild pasture, your milk is just disgusting. Depends on your breeds. Okay. Thankfully, the pastures that we've been on taste really good, okay. but we haven't we haven't really noticed a big difference. 
Um, I think it, it can if you're in places that have like a lot of, like, I don't know, we've even dosed it with garlic on a regular basis. I think it's just a garlic. common misconception. I think it's something really? that got started a long time ago because you do have some goats that have that goatier flavor to them, like the Alpines. Yeah. They've got more of a savory flavor versus the Nigerian dwarfs. And yeah. And a lot of goat milk flavor, it just milk flavor in general, whether you're cow or sheep or goat, it comes down to how you handle your milk. So for goats specifically, the more you agitate goat milk, the more you're breaking down proteins and fats and you're getting, uh, you're starting to taste caprylic acid. And that caprylic acid is where that strong goat flavor comes from. So if you're gentle with your milk and you cool it down fast, you have less protein breakdown and your milk tastes better. Mm -hmm. Same thing with cow milk. Uh, it doesn't have as much caprylic acid in it, but you're gonna get more barnyardy flavors and more off flavors if you don't cool your milk down as fast and if you are you know, sloshing it around. So that's why a lot of commercial goat cheese tastes really goaty because they're shipping in milk by the tanker truck, it's sloshing down the highway, and then it's being turned into cheese and it has that stronger goat <laughs> flavor. Yeah. So it depends on the breeds you raise. Um, we have found that a lot of dairy breeds, we haven't done a ton of experiments on like pasture, um, uh, we haven't done weed management yeah. or anything uh, with our animals because we have such an intensive dairy program, yeah. uh, but we have not noticed a difference. Yeah, because my goal with mine is, because I have uh, two Sonic cross, Lamanche crosses and then Nubians, but I want to be able to kick them out and then bring them in and give, like, grain them and milk them and then just kick them back out because I have the setup where I can do that. Yeah. Well, they're going to be happier if they're not there, so. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't wanted to ask Lonnie how she manages it. Our goats are made of sugar, and if they if they get wet and it rains, they will bolt and jump their fences. So I guess maybe if they're trained to like the rain, then it'll work better. Um, but we have pasture raised, and I prefer to pasture raise, but they will come and go a couple times a day if you let them. Um, rotational grazing is another story, right? So I think it's just training your animals to whatever you might need. <coughs> I was just worried about I mean, it, I it shouldn't. Sure I wouldn't be too worried about it. And it also depends on what you're grazing. Like, an irrigated pasture is going to taste pretty good in general. If you're grazing some pretty harsh landscapes, I think you're, you're taxing the goes systems to begin with. So that can impact potentially, but we haven't noticed it yet. Yeah. Any other questions? How good is your, um, your milk for when you, you're talking about the water bath or whatever? Do you automatically go put it in the freezer or do you leave it in the fridge for a set amount of time? Like, how do you we never put our milk in the freezer once we switch to a water bath yeah. because it cooled down fast enough in the water bath because water transfers heat faster than air does. And so that's why using a, a water bath with exchangeable ice, um, like frozen water bottles, mm -hmm. allowed us to cool our milk down so much faster. And then we just mm -hmm. dried it off and kept it in the fridge until we were ready to use it. But you don't have a set date? Like you have to use it um, so from a legal perspective, you should legally use the milk within 72 hours. Uh, so we make cheese every 72 hours or less. Uh, and that is a legal requirement because you start to get bacteria, like you still are gonna have bacterial growth in your milk even if you cool it down fast. Doesn't mean that's necessarily bad bacteria, but it can reduce the quality of your product. If you had the right system, ideally you would be making cheese twice a day. That is the best quality cheese that you could ever make. Um, from a like just drinking milk perspective, you, it can last, I don't know, it depends on your milk handling practices really. Um, the nice thing about raw milk is it generally doesn't go rancid, it just goes sour. And so you end up with clabber and then your precursor to cheese. But you do need to make sure that your milk handling practices are good. Does that answer your question? Yes. You can test it just by leaving it in the refrigerator for two weeks. See how it smells. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. See if it separates out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I think like ten days ish mm -hmm. for raw milk, but it depends on what you're doing. Any other things? Okay. So other things to think about for infrastructure, um, how you're going to raise your kids. Like I said, we just switched to bottle raising, um, so we actually have a kid barn. Uh, we separate our kids into groups of ten, um, partly because. The little babies like to bunch up, and if they're really, really little, uh, the tiny ones could potentially get crushed or suffocate, and so we keep them to like 10 or less to a pen. We'll bottle feed for, um, switch, transition them from warm milk to cold milk, and then switch them over to a bucket feeding system, so you can feed 10 kids at once on a bucket, and it reduces feeding time from like 45 minutes to 30 seconds, and it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. 
bottle feeding is a lot of work and it's very loud. <laughs> but it's important for our, our operation at the moment because we want the milk for cheese making and we want friendly goats for guest experiences. Um, so another thing to think about is where your buck's gonna live. Are you gonna have bucks? We're really concerned about biosecurity, uh, especially since we're producing milk for the public and there are zoonotic diseases that can transfer to us and to people through milk and consumption. Um, so we choose to raise our own bucks. Bucks are really good at doing their job. They can jump high fences. So you know, think about your infrastructure, make sure your fences are high enough that you have separation of space if you can. Um, we've also heard over the years that you know, if you have your buck nearby, it's gonna make your milk taste really nasty. We have not seen that either, uh, but it could be breed specific and we just work with breeds that taste really good. How do you market your buck kids or weather kids that you're not keeping? Oh. What, what's your process there? It could be better. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of different ways to market goats for sale from a, a breeding and livestock sale perspective. We, you know, are, you can grow exponentially, obviously, with herd management or with just having kids, and kids are a, necess a necessary part of running a dairy. Um, we, we focus a lot of our sales on our does, and one of the ways that you can get a higher premium for your animals is by making sure they have you know, registration, showing animals, having you know, good confirmation, linear analysis, uh, dairy herd improvement testing are all tools that you can use to show why your animals are really good and people should pay more for them. We don't show our animals because of uh, time restraints and biosecurity concerns. Um, so we market our animals mostly for dairy producing and pets because we have a lot of Nigerian dwarfs and they're cute pasture pets. Mm -hmm. um, from a buck perspective, we have done a lot of weathers. We haven't kept as many bucks, but we do have the infrastructure too. And I think one of the better ways to manage bucks if you want to sell them is to raise them up until the fall when people want to buy them for breeding. It's, I've had a lot harder time selling bucks intact in the springtime. We've done okay selling alpine bucks to uh, goat packers. But usually yeah. weathers. But yeah, weathers, yeah. Okay. But that's just one example. Yeah, but if you want intact bucks, you need to think about the fact of where you're gonna keep them because they can, they're very good at their job and they can make babies in two months. Mm -hmm. The Nigerian dwarfs specifically. So the, the Nigerian dwarfs um, actually cycle, well, all goats cycle every 17 to 21 days. The Nigerian dwarf and the Nigerian crosses cycle all year round. The big guys only cycle in the fall. So it is possible for a little baby to breed back mom at two months. So if you're wanting to do a buck breeding program, you need to think about how you're gonna separate those animals at two months-ish. So, so now that you guys are a full dairy operation, um, are you using milk replacer for your bottle feeding? We have a little. We've not, gone not back much. and forth. We still are working on some kinks in our infrastructure, mm -hmm. and so, the last couple springs, we've been under construction right at the time that we need to be, uh, right when we're kidding and need to be in production, so it's made more sense for us to feed back our milk. Mm -hmm. um, but we, our first year we did 50-50 milk replacer and um, milk. I have mixed feelings about it. They get diarrhea more and it's harder to, it's harder on the tummies, but from a production standpoint, you know, we can feed it back to the kids for whatever the cost of the milk replacer in, or in, in exchange for that, or we can turn it into like $40 a pound or $40 a gallon <laughs> right. by turning it into cheese. So it depends on what your needs are. Again, we don't live in a reality from a real business model perspective. So if you're, every drop of milk does count mm -hmm. if you're wanting to make a profit. Mm -hmm. So milk replacer, you have to do the cost analysis on whether milk replacer is gonna be a more valuable opportunity, option for you versus turning it into cheese. Odds are it's going to be better to turn it into Raw milk is another story. If you're selling the milk for ten dollars a gallon versus the replacer, it's a more narrow margin. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Um, I don't even know where I'm at. How much time I got? You got fifteen minutes. Fifteen more minutes. Okay. So things to think 15, about beyond minutes, some minutes. of that. Um, Biosecurity and quarantine space, like I said, is important to us. If we're gonna have sick animals at some point, having us the opportunity to keep them away from each other is important. Um, and if you're gonna build 
the infrastructure, having a vet room is awesome. Um, a heated space with a running, like hot running water, maybe a two to three basin sink makes a world of difference in uh, bottle feeding and just overall animal management. Um, if you're gonna build a dairy, even at a home scale, some things to consider um, is where it's located next to your barn. Where we are, we have to cross a road to get the ghosts from our milking parlor into our dairy, and it's a big pain in the butt, and it actually limits us from being a, a year-round operation to a seasonal operation. We just can't milk year-round because of the snow and the drifts because we're not connected to the barn. From a regulatory standpoint, the inspectors don't like it if your barn is physically connected to the dairy. However, it can be connected to the loading space. So as long as it's a, and you can do it, you just have to prove that you're gonna have appropriate pest management. Um, but thinking about how you're gonna move animals through your space is important, especially depending on the time of year. Um, you should have a covered and paved animal loafing area for pre and post milking. Um, we separate our animals by pre and post milking just because they're a pain in the butt and they like grain and they will totally sneak back in to get milked again if you let them because they just want grain. Um, there are regulations associated with the amount of square foot per animal for loafing spaces as well. Um, thinking about your milk stanchion layout is important. This is a picture of our stanchion. We built it out of basically uh, stop sign posts, right? That's all we, we could find. That's all we could find at the time because it was COVID. If you're going to do it right, I highly recommend building a, a cement platform. It's a lot easier to clean um, and it's a lot nicer infrastructure. Also, think about employees. We built our stanchion to our height and we're reasonably tall people. And we have found that if you're under five feet tall, you can't reach the goats. <laughs> so, <laughs> now. so now we have height requirements for our employees. Um, yep. So things to think about, things you don't think about. Um, in a dairy, you need to have a, a bulk tank room and it has to be separated from your milking parlor. It can't share the same space. Um, so you need to think about how you're gonna get your milk to your bulk tank room. Um, whether it's a pipeline system or like a hose through a, a window and a wall. Um, but having a bulk tank room is a really important part of your dairy and how you're going to transfer milk. One of the things that we can highly recommend to anybody is use gravity to your benefit. Build your dairy, your milking parlor higher than your bulk tank room and your bulk tank room higher than your vet pasteurizer. And all you have to do is open a valve and it'll flow down instead of using pumps because those pumps cost money and energy to maintain, and um, you're always gonna lose a, bit of, a little bit of milk in the milk line because you can't pump it up and over. Some infrastructure to be conscious of in your creamery, like I said, there's efficiency and scale, right? And there's a specific equipment that you can utilize in the creamery uh, that makes everything a lot easier. Um, so thinking about your make room layout, uh, always give yourself enough space Think about your maximum and minimum production levels and how that affects the equipment size you need. Um, that you need to think about your refrigeration, making sure you have enough refrigeration to handle your products. If you're gonna have aging caves, I highly recommend working with a consultant to develop an appropriate space. Um, people that work in refrigeration don't actually manage uh, aging caves and so you can't really retrofit a large scale refrigerator. On a home scale, you can take a refrigerator, plug it into an ink burn, and run it at 55 degrees. You should ideally age cheese at 55 degrees and 85 to 95% relative humidity. To manage humidity on a small scale, we've done it with like Tupperware boxes and just keeping the lid open or not. Uh, it takes some time to learn and to play with, uh, but that's an easier scenario. Working on a bigger scale, trying to get your aging caves to be the appropriate humidity has been a challenge for us, especially in Wyoming when it's you know, 10% relative humidity and we're trying to get 80. Just pumping water into a space and keeping the temperature right isn't enough. You have to control dew point. So you actually have to control the pressure at which water becomes a vapor. Um, things to think about as well are packaging and storage spaces. Um, if you're gonna be shipping and receiving uh, and how you move through the space, you shouldn't be bringing packaged products or products in your aging caves back through your make space. So understanding how products gonna flow through your facility is really important. And if you're gonna have a farm store, a creamery is regulated it's like one step below an operating room and one step above a commercial kitchen as far as regulations and food safety. Which is funny because you can also produce, you know, in a field in Europe next to your cows or your sheep and still have really good product. But we're in the US and we do have to meet all of the, the regulations set by the USDA and FDA. The last thing on infrastructure, uh, think about where your way and waste management 
or how you're going to manage your waste. Um, you know, are you going to land apply? Are you going to get it pumped? Are you going to compost? That's a potential other uh, economic uh, potential for you. Uh, on average, it takes four gallons of water to make one gallon of milk. So thinking about how much water you're going to use is important. And then pest management is also important. On a commercial scale, you have to have a third party do all your pest management. So you can't technically like manage your own mouse traps. Um, but one of the things you can do, which is awesome and I recommend it, is we work with Spalding Labs out of California, I think, and they breed uh, predator wasps, so they're fly predators. We get shipments in, we tell them how many animals we have, what our space is, where we're at geographically, and they send us a shipment of fly predator wasps. And they're teeny tiny, they're like the size of your fingernail or like a pinhead. Uh, and they lay eggs in your fly larva and keep your flies down. Because really what we do is we make poop and a whole lot of it, and that poop makes flies, so. This is a shameless plug for a company we are not affiliated with. I know, but I think the they should start paying us. The product is phenomenal, yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, and we're located next to you know a five-star restaurant, so keeping flies down is important. Yeah. yeah. What was the name of that company? Spalding Labs. It's super easy, you just get a bag in the mail, you open it up, sprinkle it around, and they go do the work for you. Uh, so some unexpected costs from a commercial side of it, I won't go too in-depth, but just understanding uh, antibiotic testing, you technically have to antibiotic test every single batch of milk you turn into cheese or every, milk, every batch of milk you receive if you're shipping it in for antibiotics. Even if you are a pharmaceutical creamery and the one administering antibiotics, you still have to test. And it's a $5,000-ish uh, startup cost with about $150 annual uh, cost in consumables. Is that for commercial or is that for just commercial? Okay. Yeah. Um, like I said, milk testing, environmental testing. Uh, if you're going to write a food safety plan, which is required for like selling through Whole Foods or a distributor, is quite expensive. Highly recommend working with a consultant, even though it is expensive, um, and some third-party inspections. I'm going to skip through the rest of this stuff really quick because it's all like commercial production. So if you have any questions about it, we can talk about it. But I don't, would rather ask answer your questions otherwise. Um, there's a lot of regulations associated with running a creamery. That's why it's worth working with a consultant. You have to have your packaging year approved, your labeling approved, there's monthly milk testing, facility testing, SOP management, recall plans. We have to track when we get a product in, how it was made, and then who bought it. So it's a, it's a big regulatory burden. It's important to understand that aspect of it if you want to take that next step. But some of the things that we learned most over the years is that selling your, you should sell your story. People are interested in you and who you are and what you do and why you matter and why your product is awesome. Um, work with consultants to help on some of the things that are really hard and above, you know, whatever your knowledge base is. They're there, they cost money, but it's worth paying for in the long run. Uh, build a really good relationship with your inspector. They're there to help you, they're not evil. And, uh, you're gonna have a lot better time if you work with them instead of against them because they can regulate you and make your life harder. Uh, and build for the future. It's a lot easier to put in two double doors into your creamery to, and um, have that allow you to change out equipment than it is to take out a wall or a window because you have to replace something. So those are, that's it for that. Um, what other questions can I answer for you guys? Anything else or do we get most of them done throughout the All right. Do you guys use doors? Yes. Okay. Um, we are happy, uh, so we're not technically open to the public, but if you're interested in seeing our facilities, uh, I can give you our business card. We'd be happy to show you around. Um, from an agro-tourism perspective, tours are an awesome way to make some more money and to uh, help educate and teach people about your product. Uh, you said you guys were starting to sell your products out in Casper. Where can I buy them? That, that was, was my question, that was too. Prior, <laughs> prior to, to this. Uh, okay, time. now where can I buy it? <laughs> Basically a brush creek. <laughs> <laughs> so I did just, I don't know, we'll see where this works out, but um, we would like to get our product into more of Wyoming. Mm -hmm. um, it shouldn't just be locked up in, in the ranch. Um, so we are still working out what our production potential is. It's only our third year in operation and we haven't really been operating at full potential because we're still getting some kinks out in our aging caves and infrastructure. Um, we are gonna start selling at uh, the sandwich company in Saratoga. They have a like meat cooler. Um, so that is an opportunity to buy our product if you want. And then hopefully we'll figure out some distribution in the future, but 
it might take a while and it might never happen because we are such a small scale. That's why that 70 to 200 goats is a sweet spot. Right now we're milking about 25. Do you have any goats for sale? Um, Give us uh, two more weeks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we had one weather left over, but I think he just found a home. Um, and we will have a lot of goats for sale. We have a lot of kids for sale. Sure. Uh, we start kidding in two and a half weeks, which is it's, it's almost time. It's really exciting, but it's a lot of work. And we'll still have goats and milk with kids on them too, so it's kind of a starter kit. So you don't have to milk. You can yeah. get the kids on, or you can kick the kids off and milk. Yeah. Yep. When we first started running animals, we were always very nervous about I guess separating the animals and you know making sure that we were getting enough production. But if it's just for your home, you can leave the babies on and just separate them off when you want to milk. Um, the things that I recommend if you're going to do it that way is interact with the babies as much as you can because it'll make them nicer and they'll be more friendly for a management perspective. Because if they're dam raised, they're not as friendly. Unless you're all up in their business all the time. <laughs> um, and you want to make sure that they have a good separation because if you do hold them back for, tw for 12 hours and the kids get out and nurse, they can actually overeat and it can hurt their bellies and it could actually kill them um, if they ate too much at once because they were withheld all night. So something to be conscious of. Do those dwarf breeds, do they stay in milk as long as like the alpines and the, mm -hmm. and the salmon? Yep. yep. Yeah, yeah, normal uh, milking uh, season is 300 days. Okay. We, ours is much shorter because of our infrastructure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, our milking season is April through end of October. Yeah. But we could go longer. You should give those at least two months off um, milking just to make sure that they have enough energy to raise babies and run all over again. All right. Thank all you right. so much, Lindsay. Yeah. Thanks, guys.